This is Ed. He's an illustrator. Hello? His career is going pretty well. There's just one problem. A problem? He's just realized he's a comic artist. I am a comic artist! He loves making comics, and he doesn't ever want to stop. It's true. But, but wait, why is there a problem? He needs to get his comics work seen. Oh, well, that's easy. I take them to mice, I um, print them out, and I sell them on Etsy, and I show them on Instagram. That's pretty good. But Ed's online portfolio was built to show his illustration and design work. It doesn't showcase his comics. He needs a website that can build his audience and attract potential clients. Oh, wow, you're right! Oh, what do I need to do, Mysterious Voice? We'll talk to comic creators Jesse Lonergan and Lucy Bellwood about their online portfolios. Kiara Valdez joins us from First Second Books to talk about online portfolios from a comics editor's point of view. And we'll also ask Elysian Kogelmeyer from Artwork Archive for her advice on what it takes to make a portfolio speak to all audiences. So, whether you're in Ed's shoes or new shoes, join the MICE team for Portfolio Rescue. Welcome to MICE, the Massachusetts Independent Comics Expo. I'm Jason Viola, and this webinar is called Portfolio Rescue for Comic Artists. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor for this program, Artwork Archive, which provides artists, collectors, and organizations a powerful suite of web tools to manage their artwork, career, or collection. They have a 30-day free trial, and you can use the button below for a special link for MICE attendees to get 20% off your first year of membership. You also have a chance to win a free lifetime membership in our fundraising raffle. Tickets are just $1. And thanks to all of our arts advocates. These are major contributors who help sustain MICE and allow the show to grow year after year. During this session, we will be giving away two free copies of the Graphic Artist Guild Handbook Pricing and Ethical Guidelines, 15th edition. If you want a chance to win, all you have to do is type your name into the chat and stick around. MICE is produced by the Boston Comic Arts Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization that funds comic art festivals, individual artists, and educational programs for the greater Boston community. If you like what we're doing here, please consider making a donation today by using the donate button in this session. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a button labeled ask a question. Please use that button to ask or vote up any questions you may have throughout the session. Also, you'll see there's a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. How about we have everyone introduce themselves? We'd love to get to know who is joining us today. Also, we will be streaming this panel to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash M-I-C-E-X-P-O for audience members who would like to use the automated, the automatic closed captioning function that Facebook Live op offers. And now I'd like to introduce MICE co-director Shelley Paraline, an Eisner award-winning cartoonist and illustrator who lives in Salem, Massachusetts. She has generously offered to help our guest coordinator and desperate artist, Ed Shems. He is a RISD graduate and has been a freelance illustrator for more than 25 years, working primarily in the education markets as well as for middle grade books and early readers. Thank you, Shelley and Ed, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Jason. And thank you all for joining us for this uh, professional development session at MICE and the very last session for the month of MICE. So Ed, oh, we're so sad. Yeah, Ed, thank you for letting us, you know, put you underneath the microscope tonight. I'm sure a lot of people are in your shoes. Well, I've got so much to figure out now that I'm doing comics. So mm -hmm. as Jason said, I've been doing illustration work for, well, more than 25 years, but I'm not going to admit that to everyone here. And I never thought I'd, that I'd want to draw comics. Uh, but now look at me, most of what I do these days is working on personal projects that are comics and graphic novels. That's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and honestly, I'm so glad that we picked this topic because um, I've been working in comics for like 10 years now. And, you know, 
just having my portfolio online is like a, it's always a moving target um, and <laughs> something that I neglect a little bit too much. And, um, and it's kind yeah. of cool to have this conversation with everybody because um, yeah, I've, my husband and I work together and we've recently realized that we had to like rebrand um, and think about our online portfolio again, like as we seek out new work. So yeah, I'm sure we're all going through this and just super excited for this conversation. Very much. And at first I thought I could just add my comics to my illustration website, but I'm realizing that they need more room to breathe and be enjoyed than regular illustrations. So, so I need to move them into their own realm, but I really don't want to just jump into creating a new site without understanding what needs to go into it all. Um, and then I don't know if I should get like Squarespace or Wix or just hire a web designer. <laughs> it's just getting so complicated to think about that. I'm just, I'm just, going to put them up on Instagram or and and I should be happy with that. Do you think that would work, that that would do it? Well, I, I really think we should just take some advice from not only, not just me, but like, you know, we should ask around. And um, uh, a friend of the show, a friend of Mice has recently like had the similar issue lately. Uh, Jesse Larnergan recently switched over oh. from you know, doing comics and, and other things to just doing comics exclusively. So um, he has some advice to give you and we can go talk to him. All right, let's see. Hi, I'm Jesse Lonergan. Uh, I'm an independent cartoonist. Um, I've been drawing comics for, I don't know, forever. Um, and uh, my most recent stuff has been coming out through Image uh, with a book out this summer and then another one coming in November. Jesse is also a prolific illustrator and posts his work frequently on social media. So we asked him how he views the difference between a curated portfolio and an Instagram feed. Um, I guess sort of I, I, I think like Instagram or any sort of social media site is sort of mm -hmm. like an OK, like testing ground to see mm -hmm. like, you know, like do, does this idea sort of have any resonance with people? Um, and then, you know, in terms of like that, that can sort of be like, maybe you should push this idea further or something like that, because this idea seems to be getting a sort of a response or something. And so I, I sort of view like the social media sites as that kind of quality for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then with the, I feel like the stuff that I've sort of put on like my website and the portfolio is much more of like, like tested already and so these are like the ones um that have more of a response or more resonance um yeah. you think of, that's literally you're curating them based on um a response on the style or is it a a, a storyline and you sort of okay the people really like this imagery and so i'm going to do a little bit more of that or i'm just going to literally right. people liked that one on Instagram so I'll put it in my portfolio is that like how you're making those choices um, I've made maybe a, a, a mix of that I, I think like with, with when you say storyline I think you start talking mm -hmm. about comics yeah um, and and I find social media doesn't like comics mm -hmm. um, social media because comics are a little too complicated um, you know I, I find the, the social media brain is like look at it understand it like it don't like it like that's that's about the time frame for for something on social media mm -hmm. and, and and a comic requires a little too much like involvement especially if it's more than like a page you know and and everything i do comic books wise is more than a page um, jesse organizes the work on his portfolio site into illustration and comics his most recent work is Hydra, published by Image Comics. We asked him how he goes about choosing which pieces to highlight in his portfolio. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of still think, I, I sort of think of the website as being like constantly under construction mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> I don't know, I'm just like, I think more is always better. Okay. Um, and so I'm like, oh, it needs to have more images, more stuff. But like when I was, setting it up and I, I was setting it up with the help of somebody who knows all the technical stuff um, like I was just like these are these are the comics that I'm ready to post right now like and they're they're set up um, 
and I think I just chose the ones that I'm sort of like the, the most happy with, the most confident with, um, that I feel, you know, showed like a, a mix of things that I do, um, because I think I may be getting less varied than I used to be, but like in the past, I feel like really there is no, <laughs> no consistency, uh, not, not consistency, but like you get something like Hydra, but then you get something that's like, looks like it was drawn with my left hand. Uh, and then you get something that's like much more like down to earth and, and uh, real, I guess. Um, and sort of like trying to show stuff that's sort of a good example of the various things um, that I do. But I think as I'm working now, it's, that's becoming less, less diverse, maybe. Okay, so you're streamlining a yeah, style so. and a attitude and a genre maybe right yeah. now, right? Yeah, um, I, I think it's partly just like, you know, like uh, for me, there used to always be before I would start a project, like, and there still is like, but I hope I'm trying to reduce it, like this sort of like crisis of like, who am I and like, what am I doing and why am I doing it and how, how is this idea done? Um, and I'm trying to just have it be like, okay, this is the idea and this is the way I do things. Uh, so, so there is less of a, a crisis. Uh, yeah, because I wanted to ask, something. you have a lot more graphic novels than you show on your comic section of your website. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess with, with sort of with the website, I, I kind of think of it a little bit like a business card uh, mm -hmm. almost as like, like, you know, if you're, you're trying to do this thing, you just need to have a place people can go to that's, you know, designated for yourself. Um, and sort of representative, what I chose to put on would also be like the kind of work I would like to get. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things got the priority. And so like, I don't actually really want to do comics like the stuff I did 10 years ago. Um, and so those were not a priority. I might still put them up at, at some point, like, or put up a section of them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was partially also thinking like, what would I like people to ask me to do? Um, you know, and not, not necessarily showing stuff that I don't actually want to do. Yeah. So my next question is, um, where do you, how and where do you display your comics to get a publisher's attention? How do you get in front of readers? And do yeah. you take a different approach to the two? Um, I, I really don't know how to get a publisher's attention. Um, well, you said that you said that with Hydra, you submitted it. It sounds like to to Image. No, I didn't. Um, so I, I think Hydra got picked up. I think this is my understanding of the process of what happened. Somehow Matt Fraction bought it, um, and then Matt Fraction or Kelly C. DeConnick told Eric Stevenson about it. And then Eric Stevenson sent me an email on Etsy, an Etsy message asking if I'd like to do a mass mass market version. And I I think Matt Fraction and Kelly Sue the comic probably found out about it through Twitter. Um, like I, I've just I just tweeted a sale about it that like a video of it and it seemed like for for me like it was like a big tweet. <laughs> um, it was, I don't know. It got shared a bunch, uh, and so. Right. It, it got, Hedra got seen that way. Um, and that's how Eric, it got in front of Eric Stevenson. But I, I had submitted it to a few publishers, but they had, there hadn't been interest in, in doing a version of it. You know, it's interesting that you have really a presence on all these different places. And it feels as though like you're thinking about like who you are on Twitter, like who, you, like what you really need to do, like on Etsy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still great that there was some contact information available on Etsy in order to make that connection. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then your portfolio is just, that's the, that's a curated place. Like that's where you've got them all. Yeah. But not it, to be it, like, we're, we're not trying to pull it out of you. Like, shouldn't you have no, a no. website, Jesse? <laughs> sorry, like, sorry no, no, no. Not, not doing a great job. Like, no, um, no, no, it's actually, it's really interesting to hear no, your, it, your thought process here. And this is the thing that a lot of people are struggling with is like, we literally do live on all these different platforms yeah and you know and then you gotta hope that they find you in the right place um yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess i would like a website i, I think it, it really is just sort of like um 
I, I, I said a business card earlier. I, I kind mm -hmm. of think that way. It's like also if you're just like applying to conventions or anything like that, like yeah. you need to have a website just because like if you have like an Instagram link, it's I, I feel I look at that and I think, oh, unprofessional, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and so it, it's partly that it's also just like it's a place people can go to get an idea of who you are. Um, I find it's it's also it's a, it's a good sort of like in terms of if people are going to contact you for work, it's like a good editor <laughs> of who's <laughs> going to contact you because mm -hmm. like it, Instagram and Twitter or, or Facebook, it, there's sort of almost like there's no effort involved. And so like almost all the stuff that comes through like my contact through the website is, is more legitimate. Like mm, it, it's that's so interesting. It, it's, it's more likely to result in something. Um, it's more likely to be from someone who understands uh, that this is a job and I would like to be paid uh, for it. While like I find things on Instagram and Twitter, oftentimes it'll just be someone being like, can you do free work? Um, and, and so I, I feel immediately when I get something through like a contact page on, on my website, that it's uh -huh. like a, a better contact. Um, than just something that comes through social media. So do you feel like people you want to sell your books to have a good, the, that your website is a good place for them to, uh, to see your work and does it sell you? Do you feel like it sells your books? Maybe, M maybe it does. Hmm. I, I really just do sort of think of it as like a landing pad yeah. um, because like all, all those, like, like Instagram and all those places, those are places people go every day like, you know, I don't, I don't know how about you guys, but like, like there are definitely people who like start their day on like these, these social media places. And that I don't think there's anybody that's going to start on my website. And so like mm -hmm. it, 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 I think is a right. much less active place, but it, it is like, like a home base where you can sort of go and, and see stuff if you want to know more. Um, and yeah, social media is just more of a like, kind of almost just like a promotional place. So when I look at your, well, okay, I'll ask you this. Do you, do you find it helpful to selling your books or getting jobs to show art beyond the cover on your site? Uh, yeah, I think you, I definitely have to show the interior because I'm really bad at covers. So um, uh, I, I feel that's like my, my curse. It's like, <laughs> I'm really bad at covers. Um, so I always, I always feel like at least it depends how long, like, like the book is, but at least like six pages. Um, if it's, if it's a, a much longer thing, I think it could be more just like a, a narrative chunk or something like that. But um, for me, like, in just like sort of my personal interest, like the comics are the thing and the, the, the sequence of images is the thing and like how, how that is told. So I, I, if I could, I would just skip the covers and just show the comic book page. Um, and yeah, sequential. And, and yeah, you know, definitely. you wouldn't skip a page or so no, just to show more pages, I, right? I would be confused. Mm, <laughs> like, right. like if I, I, mean, would, like, I, I would get, actually probably be angry. Well, because, well, I, I guess what I would feel is like, so the way like my website's set up, it's like basically like you click on the comic and then like, image pops up and then you it just scrolls sideways yeah. um and so to so to put in a separate section it's still just going to scroll sideways and you're going to get that like page seven and then all of a sudden page 28 um and i would just be very confused by that transition probably and think that they're really bad at storytelling um <laughs> you know like i'd be like wow this this is they lost me um, I, I have no idea where I am. So it's just sort of like, I think one, one chunk is kind of yeah. enough. Um, yeah, it's almost like we have to think that someone who's going to your website, there's some, as you say, maybe serious people are looking at it <laughs> at that time. And they're reading, they aren't having the same Instagram experience where it's right. just like, you know, like we, it is a somewhere where we have a little bit more of an attention span and we'd expect that we would read the comics that are available. Yeah. All right, great. So Ed, what do you think? What are some takeaways from, from Jesse's advice? 
well, I'm realizing that maybe Instagram might not be the right solution. I can still use it, but considering what Jesse said, that social media doesn't like comics, what do you say? Well, yeah, it's a great testing ground for sure. But he, he said, like, you look at it, you understand it, you like it, or you don't like it. You just kind of move on uh, from the comics are posted there. Um, so really what we're thinking is your portfolio is the place for people who are like going to look for you and your comics. Um, so that's why it's important to have a portfolio. Right, right. So I think I still need to consider how to create a comics portfolio. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't have a ton of time tonight, like to talk about like the platforms that are available, like per se, but we have plenty more people to talk to. Um, are you saying that, that I can't use a pre-built platform that we're not going to talk about that tonight? Cause that would make my life so much easier. Come on. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it would. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's talk to Elysian uh, Kolemeyer, who's part of Artwork Archive. Their platform is like exclusively like on web portfolios for creatives. Um, so they really do know what they're talking about, you know, but does that interest you? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Right. I mean, uh, I guess once we figure out what the content is mm -hmm. and, and um, once we understand those concepts, then we can apply it to whatever platform it is. That's yeah. Correct. Okay. Let's, yep. let's go to Elysium. Elysium. Okay, great. So I'm Elysian Kogelmeyer. I'm with the Artwork Archive team. Originally from Massachusetts, grew up in Gloucester, um, but now am in Denver, <laughs> Colorado with the Artwork Archive team. Uh, what we do over at Artwork Archive is we are, in, we are an online art inventory management system. So we work with artists and makers of all type that need to keep track of their portfolios, which we're talking about today. Collecting. So Ed here has a lot going on in his head about his new portfolio. So let's just narrow things down to what content goes into the online portfolio. What do you recommend um, for artists to select the right pieces in the first place? So it's all about getting eyes on your on your comics and the, your creation. So the, the tips that we have um, are not to feel pressured to include every single piece you have ever created. So hopefully, Ed, that makes you feel a little bit better. Like, oof, um, not everything. <laughs> Um, that can be overwhelming and um, not all works will showcase you in your, your best light. You know, um, some pieces may be um, comics and creations, drafts, maybe just works, works in progress. Um, uh, so what we recommend also is um, don't include works that aren't your best. Um, you're only as good as your worst piece when showcasing your portfolio. Um, and that being said, if you do have a variety in style um, and in type, it is great to show that diversity, but to make sure that it is um, the best, your best works. You talk a lot in your article about um, the importance of high quality images for your artwork and, mm -hmm. and making sure that, um, that, that you have working links going on there. What, what, can you talk a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the article that Ed's referencing, we have some some best practices on how to showcase your portfolio. Um, and one that we see um, not to be taken for granted is what you mentioned is to take high res images. You, know, you don't necessarily need a, a DSLR camera. You can take some great ones with your, your smartphone. And we also have an article on our blog, um, artworkarchive.com backslash blog on how to photograph your artworks like a pro without having to hire someone. Um, and a common mistake in portfolios that we have seen that actually relates to the like what pieces, uh, what comics to show, what to show from your portfolio um, is having too many images. So more isn't always necessary, necessarily better. Um, another a common mistake that we see for those that um, continue to create and make is not to update your portfolio. Um, and so if someone wants to see your recent works to make sure that they're on hand, um, and that you're always prepared. Um, another common mistake that we, we see is um, not having your information, having a headshot, um, a statement, a biography, um, and you can consider th things like maybe testimonials of people who have purchased your, mm -hmm. your comics and why um, your comics spoke to them, right? Anything to build a connection with that, with that viewer. So, so um, you, you, you speak to this, how um, the portfolio shows needs to show your professionalism, and and I think you've you've 
pointed out so many different things, um, both now and in the uh, in the article. Um, anything anything more that you want to say that will kind of help people understand the importance of looking professional? Yes, and and that you have you create a high quality work, a good quality of work. Online portfolios are one of the most important tools in a creative's toolbox because um, they serve a big purpose. They they show the best of who you are as a as a creative, um, and it's an, also an opportunity, which I mentioned earlier, to you know capture the hearts of start relationships with potential clients. Um, and it's also a place for potential clients to look online and to verify your history and credentials and just to learn more about your, your work. Because we say that um, an online portfolio is like your digital calling card, a little cheesy, um, but promoting your artwork, um, your comics, your creations online and in person is you know really being, it's a big part of being a creative entrepreneur, which you all are. Uh, really quickly too is that you spend a lot of time on your comics and I don't know how much how much time a day do you think um, you spend working away well let me count uh too much <laughs> all right there very too much <laughs> 20 25 hours in the 24 days uh 24 mm -hmm. hours, 24 hours um, right <laughs> no um, that first one was accurate <laughs> it's 25 <laughs> hours in a day <laughs> yeah you just make a new hour appear oh, somehow yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. All while watching Netflix, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's important to spend that thoughtful time on how you're presenting and, and sharing it because you spent so much time and energy and emotion, you know, putting yourself into the, the comic in itself. Um, mm -hmm. And so with, especially during our digital era with communications and sharing online, it's important to have a polished portfolio organized and available so you make yourself polished and organized and professional mm -hmm. um, and thus uh, appealing. And it also just speaks to, um, you know, things that are maybe harder to get across uh, just with your, your work and that um, you as a, uh, someone that they'd be interested in working in. So you are mm -hmm. organized and you can manage your, your assets. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and so right. makes, what we say is it makes a difference between an amateur and a, and a professional. So what does it mean to tell a story with your portfolio? So there's a few things when, when telling a story with your portfolio as it pertains to a comic artist. Um, so the first is what we have found um, with makers of all type is that people want to learn about you as a creative um, and that actually on a website and on an online portfolio, the about pages are often the most frequently visited page on a maker's portfolio. Um, and so art is so much more than that pen on paper. Um, every artwork, every comic um, has a story, quite literally with comics. Mm -hmm. um, so sharing the inspirations, the, the journey to creation, the care and devotion taken with every pen stroke or pencil stroke, um, the message that it, it's telling. Also, it made me think of practically speaking, alongside your portfolio pieces, you can include a bit of the story there. You were saying, you know, we kind of want people to like emotionally connect to these things and they are just getting a sampling of this comic. So potentially we could, you know, uh, recommend that people include a little bit of what they were thinking about when they created this comic, that sort of thing. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, exactly. You nailed it. <laughs> okay. That's exactly it is, um, you know, people love to hear, you know, the creative process you're thinking if there was um, an experience that happened in your own life, or maybe, um, you know, family history that lends itself or mm -hmm. just like, you know, um, the happenstance that made this this character pop into your your mind, mm -hmm. like whatever it may be, people are fascinated of the, you know, the behind the scenes. Yeah. Something about what you just said earlier about, um, people, they might discover you on Instagram, but they're gonna to wanna to go to your professional site, yeah. your portfolio site. I think it's also important to point out that your professional site shouldn't be all about selling. It shouldn't be, you don't go to that site and it says, buy my book. And then you have to kind of hit something to go find the comics. Um, it should be find the comics and then buy the book. So it's not, a, it doesn't feel like a hard sell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't, flow. We, didn't, yeah. we didn't get into the, I didn't get into the nuts and bolts even more so with a portfolio trying to keep it like big, big picture. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but that there is like, if you guys wanted to expand upon that, there is that thing and that people are put off when they're being sold to for yeah. sure. 
like we see that with a lot. And so that's where we talk about the storytelling, talk, talking about you, have them something to um, identify with and, and to gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's a piece like with the portfolio is to show, um, yeah, just show like, to show a cohesive story, to tell a cohesive story of who you are and that your, your book to purchase is one, one part of that, but to give, give them that mm -hmm. journey to explore. Um, and I, I mean, coming from like the world that I come from with like my dad being a make, like the process, uh, I just love the process. Right. And mm -hmm. that's why I love the gifts and the time lapse. And mm -hmm. I think that that, um, and it is what distinguishes you because there are a lot of websites that are just static, um, and yeah. books being sold and buy now. Right. And so things that differentiate right. yourself, um, and that give people some entertainment during this really nasty <laughs> You know? Or like give yourself some enjoyment, like it's fun yeah. to make those videos. We want to take a look at a few examples of portfolios that tell a story. The site for Ingrid Pierre's comic, Do Not Resuscitate, not only tells a story about her work, which she describes as a gothic graphic novel about the horror of loneliness, but she also thinks about the experience of visiting her portfolio site. Notably, she includes a video about creating her first graphic novel. Cartoonist Ellie Schwed organizes her comics portfolio simply and effectively. Every graphic novel and mini comic has their own single page, and it is introduced with a brief description of the project, photo of the book, and a large scale selection of pages. All right, and we're back. Cool. Oh, I want to go back to Ellie's website. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, yes, we're giving you a lot of, a uh, lot of information. So if anyone's taking like copious notes at home, please know that we have a resource guide available. Like you can click, click the link below um, to our session page. And we've got that as like a, a, a Google doc shared with all of you. So um, hopefully that's helpful. So, and, <clears throat> and also like, just so you know, like in that way, we've kind of cataloged like all the concepts that we're, that we're, that we're preaching here <laughs> that, you know, hopefully you can apply to any platform, whether it be something like we just heard or Wix, WordPress, Squarespace, like you've heard of them all. Um, but this is actually like the place where you should start. Um, it's just with these ideas. That's right. So I, I really like what Alicia had to say about telling a story with my portfolio. Mm -hmm despite what Dave might say. With my illustration portfolio, I just give some basic info about the project and client, mm. and that's all that's really needed. And typically it's a job assigned to me by a client, so there's not much more to say. But with a con comic, it's way more personal. There's so much more that needs to be said to get people to understand where I was coming from. Yeah, that's really great. And I think we're, we're totally starting to get somewhere. <laughs> and I have like just the person to talk to next. <laughs> so and she's in chat. She's in the oh, chat yes. too. Perfect, perfect. Right, that You're gonna hear her in stereo. It's Lucy Bellwood, um, who has a lot more good things to say along the lines of how to tell a story with your portfolio. Let's hear from her. Lucy Bellwood, welcome. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, so my name's Lucy. I am an adventure cartoonist. I'm usually based in Portland, Oregon. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm really excited to talk to you about websites a thing that I never thought I would be saying, but here we are in the year 2020. <laughs> so let's get started. Let's jump in. Um, I'd love to get an understanding of who is your audience and who's going to your website and who did you make it for? I think just trying to consider the different tiers of who might come to my website. Uh, I've got people who encounter me or my work in a context where they're unfamiliar with me. Let's say they see me on a panel at a comics convention, they hear me on the radio, uh, they read an interview with me somewhere, and my website is listed, you know, alongside my name, or they Google my name, right? And that's the first thing that comes up. And so you're looking to build on context that people might already have about who you are, but primarily to give, uh, to give them a sense of like, this is me, the person, if you'd like to learn more about me, here are some ways you can do that. So that's your like, I don't know, your, your level one, like stranger, your interested stranger. And then I would say level two is like 
curious fans, people who follow me on social media and generally engage with me primarily in those spaces, but they go to my bio, or maybe it's someone who's thinking about following me on social media and they're like, who's this Lucy Bellwood person? They go to my Twitter page and they read my bio, they read Adventure Cartoonist, and then they're like, that sounds interesting, sign me up, and they click my website. So you wanna give as complete a picture you can as uh, of the person that you are. And then third, I would say professional colleagues. That's like people who already know who you are and want to hire you uh, or buy things from you. I guess professional colleagues could also be customers. And then there's people who are like true fans who just come to your, I feel like it's a definition of a true fan if you voluntarily visit an artist's website just for fun <laughs> these days. Like I, I really can count on one hand the, the pages on the internet that I like explicitly visit to go see what an individual creator is up to. So it's tricky because you're, it's not like you're building a product for one person. And this is the hard mm -hmm. part about being a creative person on the internet anywhere at any time is that like you have to try to cater to all comers uh, mm -hmm. and, or the temptation is to cater to all comers. I, I, am, I firmly believe that it is valuable to isolate like who the most valued people are that you want to reach and then it makes sense to dedicate right. more energy to like there's more return on investment and i don't even mean monetarily just like i don't know whatever non-monetarily yeah <laughs> um that it, it's worth it it's the same as the principle of like saying no to work that doesn't align with your values or mm -hmm. make you happy leaves more room in your life for work that does even though as freelancers we're like deeply allergic to saying no to anything because it's very <laughs> scary well, it's interesting because you cater you you really some of your work caters to a very specific group yeah. so <laughs> baggy wrinkles very specific hundred demon dialogues very specific but i struggle with it conventions because i think your convention table you know if we ever do conventions again uh is kind of like your website right it's mm -hmm. a, it's an advertising space that people come to and they're looking to see what your brand is at a glance and I struggle now because uh, it used to be that I could be like, I'm an adventure cartoonist. Here are some books about adventuring on the high seas. Here are some books about adventuring over here. And now I find that I have like, here's the adventure half of my table. And then here's the introspective, touchy feely, emotional uh, integration part of my table. These things are related. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that has been, no, I, I don't think as much of a problem as I was anxious that it might be because a lot of the time people are coming for me and they don't actually really care what I'm making if that makes sense that's you know? nice yeah uh, yeah it's 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 fortunate um but I I do find that there is a bit of a challenge there to kind of enfold everything and this is the same with uh being a cartoonist in general I think is that it is I, I wish I knew who had first come up with this comparison but it's been described as a dilettante medium because you mm -hmm. need to have a little bit of everything right there's a little bit of graphic design and script writing and there's analogous skills from theater and film and you're bringing in illustration chops and all this stuff mm -hmm. and so typically if you're an illustrator with a website which I believe you have been right for many years now it's uh, mm -hmm. I'm Ed I make the art here's the art you can hire me for the art, the <laughs> end. <laughs> like, and it can be a challenge, I think, when you're a cartoonist that you are really like a gun for hire for any number of visual storytelling, problem solving mm -hmm. gigs. And the stuff that's come across my dashboard from people emailing me through my website, you know, is there, there have been things that I just could not have anticipated. On the yeah, other side, like, I think too, that it, it, I don't want to say it's just fashionable that we're cartoonists and yeah. making comics, but even if you just look from the point of someone's trying to hire you as just an illustrator, they just want you to do an illustration, it might be more alluring to them that you have this practical knowledge of cartooning. You know, you can do so much more. You're spinning so many more plates. You're telling more stories um, with yeah. your illustration as well. So Absolutely. Lucy welcomes visitors to her site's homepage with a truly authentic voice. She writes, I'm happiest when I'm translating the world into infectiously enthusiastic, vulnerable, educational stories for my readers to enjoy. She leads on with a little bit more about herself and her major works, A Hundred Demon Dialogues and Baggy Wrinkles, A Lubber's Guide to Life at Sea, where to find her across the internet, and a sampling from her comics portfolio. We asked her about the steps she took and questions she asked herself when putting this all together. And it's, mm -hmm. it's funny that we have this conversation because I'm on the brink of redesigning my site right now 
to turn it into a place where I will be more excited to go and share have stuff. an experience, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it is I want other people to have a good time there, which it seems like both of you have, which is great to hear. Uh, but also I want to, I want to feel a sense of ownership over it. And I think this is the, the line between how in order to build spaces on the internet that are fun to inhabit, you need a certain degree of technical facility and you can make amazing websites out of the box with WordPress or Squarespace, um, you know, or even Tumblr artists have been using for portfolios for quite a while. But I think there is something, and this is just a broader point that I'm sure other people have touched on, that having a personal website is like, you are making yourself real to a potential client. And I cannot tell you the number of times I want to hire somebody recommend a person for a position, like do anything. And I go looking for them and all I can find is a a Twitter account that doesn't use their real name, maybe a link to a Tumblr. There's no contact me tab. Or if I want to contact them, I have to send a Tumblr message. And just like, I, I think the watchword that I tell mentees at Helioscope, the studio I'm a part of, uh, is always just like, make it as easy as possible for Mm -hmm. people to give you money, to hire you, and to follow your work. Like that's, those are the things that I think are, are the most important. Um, the things that I've learned from looking at other people's sites and certainly a thing that I know I mentioned earlier that people are generally buying into the experience of me and not my work, which mm-hmm. comes with job hazards, uh, not gonna lie. And it's not for everybody. I've had friends who are like, I can't have a Patreon. Like I have to make a Patreon that is for a project. I can't make a yes. Patreon that's for me. Um, which is wild because I'm like, I can't make a Patreon that's just for a project. What happens when I'm done with that project and totally reinvent myself, which happens all the time. (laughs) So like, how would I, how would I survive that? I I feel like I'm, I'm interested in building a container that is flexible enough to accommodate whatever I might be interested in now or in the future. I guess that's the, Mm -hmm. that's the short answer. Um, And I think that includes trying to convey what I'm most excited about right now. There's a, there's a trend in um, web design. I can't, is it Derek Sievers? Sievers started this thing, I think, of having a now page on your mm-hmm. website, which would just be like lucybellwood.com slash now, which is like, here is what I am currently interested in, which I think is very distinct from having a bio page where you're like, here's what I've done. Yeah. Uh, and there's some things that like bios, for example, there, a website is also a tool that's designed to save you work and get you work. And Mitchie Trota has an amazing uh, bio page. Uh, she is, uh, um, has edited uh, Uncanny Magazine um, for many years and um, is part of a fire performance troupe in Chicago as well, does a bunch okay. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and has a bio page that is, it's so good. There is, you go to the page and it's like, here is a 50 word bio here's a 100 word bio, here's a long form bio, here are high resolution press shots of me from different angles that you are allowed mm-hmm. to use with yeah. author credit, you know, baked into them. Um, here's all of my social media. And it's like, she has clearly built a space where if you're doing an interview with someone and they're like, hey, could you send us a quick bio? Rather than being like, uh, which is like everybody's <laughs> least favorite thing. You're like, absolutely, my dude, go over here. Uh, and then contact page uh, is is the like the really big one, right? Talking about making it easy for people to get in touch. Um, just making it like anytime somebody might be curious about a next step. I think in web design, a lot of the time you're you're figuring out like what's the call to action mm-hmm. on a particular page, and it could be buy my book, it could be read these comics, sign up for my newsletter, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, the author Robin Sloan is a really good example of this. He has a very um, minimal and cool website and it's very clear, like he's written a bunch of books, he's uh, given talks and things that he links to, but on every page, there's a little box that says, really the thing to do here is sign up for my newsletter. And that's just like on every single page. And it's very chatty and personable and his website is kind of kooky and weird. And it creates this feeling of, you're in, you're in the club, you're in the circle. And I should say that uh, typically when I have a new book coming out, I've found that it's a good idea to make an explicit page on my website that is about that book so that people who find me, and I think this was actually, I bought 100demondialogues.com as a domain. And then I mm-hmm. had it redirect to this page on my website, which is something you can do that's not super difficult. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that's really exciting to hear that when you're coming out with a book, you create a page just for that book. That's well, that, 
I really think interesting. Like, if you go to a convention with a new project, I find that if I have a new mini comic and I go to a con, the first person, and I'm like so excited to sell it. And then the first person who walks up to the table says, oh, uh, what's this? <laughs> and I stare at them and I'm like, it, it's, a, uh, it's a comic about, well, I went, uh, I went on this trip and it's <laughs> just like word spaghetti comes out of my face for 40 seconds. And then maybe they buy it or they don't buy it. Mm -hmm. And the next person who comes up and says, oh, what's this about? I'm like, well, it's a book about this thing and this and that. And then it's maybe 30 seconds and then it's 20 and then it's 10. And like, the more, I, I really think going to conventions or like having to pitch your work to strangers and friends is a skill that I have not been able to master except through falling on my face in public. Like I, I have never <laughs> been able to accurately rehearse a sales pitch in my room because so much of that feedback is like, you can see what lights people up. Yeah, what they want. Mm -hmm. When you're talking right. to them, you know? So I would say that the website probably comes after I've been or I refine it based on what I'm saying at a convention. And I, I think the need to have a website or the stuff that I put on that page was really driven by noticing, hey, if somebody comes up to your table, you need to be able to tell them in 50 words or less why they should care. You know? But yeah, this was, what is on the website now is certainly a product of traveling around the country and talking to hundreds of people about the book and having to really figure out like what, what people found valuable about it. And that's actually something I'm very grateful for in this conversation is that you very rarely get the chance to talk to people and say, um, interesting, this website seems authentic to you. Why is that? <laughs> no, we're going to ask you that. <laughs> no, because <laughs> in websites, it's like all I'm doing, you know, is just trying stuff and being like, I don't know what maybe this will, but I, I don't very often get to talk to people who see the website in the way that I would get to talk to people who come to my table at a convention, yeah. right? Some different, right. Different so it's absolutely. almost like a portfolio review. For yeah. me. Oh yeah. We're That's trying right. to demystify this. So glad yeah. you could read your ad to like give me the yeah. feedback I desperately need. <laughs> right, right. So why don't we stop and start at the top? Yeah, okay. So yeah. there is a um there's a header image uh, mm -hmm. that has the the breakdown right of, of all the different comics in the background. I feel like daily drawing projects that share a format are great for stuff like this because they have a sort of unified aesthetic that you can be like, here's some stuff. Um <laughs> There's a, uh, a header, I feel like, so for people who aren't like familiar with basic HTML or formatting, uh, you, there are different classifications of text. And I think using headers is like an underutilized thing for a lot of folks who are blogging or sharing text on the internet. So the, the header is gonna be a little larger, it's gonna be in bold. And that's basically the tagline of the book. 100 Demon Dialogues is a collection of comics for anyone who deals with a little voice in their head that says, you're no good. And the hope is that people will read that and 98% of people will be like, that's me. <laughs> and then they will read on. Then there's a photo of the book um, taken from sometime during the Kickstarter, I think. And then there's a little more of a description that kind of expands on that pitch. Um, and this is, I think generally, this is like copy that I used on the, the book sales information that went out to stores. So if you like look this up on Barnes and Noble or Amazon mm -hmm. or whatever, um, it'll, show you this copy probably and then so i have type a copy that would be on the back of the book say yeah exactly just it's just something yeah. mm -hmm. and usually like when you when you release a book um for folks who aren't familiar you send out a sheet to retailers that's like here's the isbn here's the title here's the author here's how many pages it is here's the format here's a summary and when you populate that information into the great big machinery of publishing, that's what every retailer will scrape from when they list the book on their website. And that can include pull quotes from other um, authors or like advanced reviews and stuff like that. So, right. so then I include um, one big sample. I chose entry number 41 uh, to just give people an idea of like, here's the format, here's the setup. Uh, then I include ordering information, which is pretty clear about not only can you buy books, there are plushies and postcards and stickers and prints. There's like the whole thing. The first thing I'm going to link to is always a place that I own and get the majority of the funding from. I'm, I am not interested. So you can see it's kind of like listed in order of interest where I'll say, if you want to support an indie bookshop, you can shop from Powell's, which is my local indie you can find the nearest indie bookshop to you on IndieBound. Um, bookshop.org wasn't a thing when I made this website, but I should probably update it with a bookshop link. That's a cool website that's been doing a lot for um, 
channeling funds to indie bookstores. Mm -hmm. And then there are digital editions of the book, which is a separate conversation about making um, like Kindle compatible uh, editions on Amazon, iBooks, and Gumroad. And then there's a photograph of me with the demon. And like, again, I think a lot of the time when people come to my table at conventions and they see the book and then, or they see my work and they open it and then they look at me and they look at the book and they're like, that's you. <laughs> and I think anytime you can give people that uh, translation of like, wow, you're just like the way you draw yourself. Um, I think that's why it's, it's nice to have a photo just to be like, look, here's me and the plush demon and then you can look at 100 drawings of me and the fictional demon. I, I love that you're here with the demon and you're happy <laughs> right like yeah he's so soft you, it's so, you it's, made it you made it past him you, exactly you conquered him right and that also is a good opportunity when i'm talking about the 100 day project so i'm calling out an external thing and hopefully empowering people to try it themselves if they're interested and then i can also use that as an excuse to link back to my previous 100 day project a life and mm -hmm. objects right so again you're trying to like interweave and then there's another example of uh, demon drawings. And then it's, here are all the comics. Have at them. Uh, and I recycled one of the goofy gifts that I made for the Kickstarter campaign, which, um, so this is, uh, the, the images are hosted in a, uh, a plugin called Foo Gallery. Um, and WordPress has a bunch of plugins that you can install to help you share and uh, uh, display images in different ways. So it's got a setup here that is responsive. If you resize the window, you'll see that the, the number of images in the thumbnail stack gets bigger or smaller. And then if you click on one, it'll enlarge it. But what I like about this display methodology is that you can, once the image is enlarged, um, you can navigate using arrow keys, which is something that, you know, old school web comics readers will recall was so much more intuitive when you're, especially when you're catching up on a lot of a web comic to just be able to press arrow keys back and forth rather than having to scroll all the way to the bottom of a page, find the tiny next arrow, press the next arrow, accidentally press the latest arrow, have to go back and find your place, like <laughs> big nightmare. And then you can exit out of that viewer at any time. Um, and that's, and all 100 comics are on display there. Uh, I think if I were editing this page now, I would probably add something at the bottom of the gallery, just reminding people like, hey, if you like this, you can buy it, um, mm -hmm. which is not there currently, just looking at this website because I haven't in a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's nice to have a, a coherent home for your project online. And something I've struggled with with other projects is that I would love to build galleries for every comic I've done like this, you know, that have a nice high resolution um, version of the image. And because the nature of making comics is that you're often sharing little like three to five page stories for anthologies here and there, mm -hmm. it's, you don't want to have a page for every single one of those. So I've contented right. myself with like a page for books. And then there's a page that's like other comics and, um, or online comics. And Again, on that page, um, there's a header that says you can buy copies of this in my shop uh, and you can also get digital copies on Gun Road. And then also here's everything for free. And I think just trusting your audience to make the distinction for themselves. I don't currently have anything on my website that's like a pop-up that's going to force you to sign up for my newsletter after you've been on the page for 10 seconds or like... <laughs> I don't know, a promise that I'll send you a free comic if you give me your email. Like, I'm not really, I'm not really into that as a, <laughs> as a method. Um, but I like the idea of just, you know, presenting people with the options, making it easy for them if they're interested, and then just trusting that they're going to have their own interaction with the text and just trying to right. make that, or with the, with the content, and trying to make that as smooth and pleasurable as possible for people. Great. Yeah, that was awesome. I'm just so grateful to have that breakdown of a site for a comic for sequential pieces and uh, hopefully learn something there. Um, Lucy suggests, uh, I think a really good takeaway was that Lucy suggests looking at other websites of um, visual artists or storytellers, uh, just looking at their portfolios for inspiration and not just um, illustration portfolios, right, Ed? What do you think? Right, right. And I love the idea of breaking down my audience so in case anyone missed it, we, mm -hmm. we put the levels she talked about into the resources page for this talk. And there are so many other gems she told us that we just had to cut out for time. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, like uh, Lucy had a great suggestion um, that she had hired someone to optimize her images to make her portfolio accessible for people who are visually impaired. That's something that you can easily do, like by using alt text, uh, for instance. Um, and it's a, it's just, it's a great idea. Just love it. Um, so who's the audience member you're most interested in, actually? So I'm working on pitches for graphic novels, so I'm hoping mm -hmm. to attract a publisher, of course. Ooh, okay. So that's our last interview for the evening. So oh. yeah, let's talk to Kiara Valdez. Who's Wait, assistant. now? Yeah. Who is she? You ready? Is she? She's an assistant editor at First Second. I, I haven't brushed my teeth yet. Can we wait? <laughs> All right. Let's just All right. go. Ahead. Just go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> so, so Kiara, you went to MICE last year. And what was your next step after picking up a cool comic? So I usually pick up quite a few. So I put them in my bag. And when I get back to the office, usually, because it's such a word, like a blur, um, I read them. And oftentimes, the reason why I go to places like Mice and other cons is to find talent. Like, that is actually my, I mean, of course, I enjoy the experience. Um, but it is my goal. Uh, so I see if I, any of the comics really strike uh, something in me and I see if the person has a, a like a website or mm -hmm. somewhere I can or a Twitter or something like that yeah so you're following up with the yeah. work that you see yeah usually yeah. like if not all of it but things that I really like so mm -hmm. you you go from a uh, con with books and you um you find someone that you're interested in and how do you get a sense of a comic creator's visual storytelling when you go to their portfolio their online portfolio on, honestly, just their sequentials, which I would 100% mm -hmm. hope that they have a bunch of in their portfolio. Um, and I usually like when they have old works. I mean, I know some artists like want to take down their old stuff out, um, but I like seeing a progression of their style mm -hmm. and see like what have they learned, like what is different from what they did in the past to what they do now. And it's kind of hard. It's like such a blunt answer. Like I just read what they have, but yeah. it's really hard to hide behind a page of comics. You know, it's like kind of mm -hmm. out there in the open. Um, you can see how they work the page. You can see how they're doing their dialogue. Um, there's no hiding. So like I, I and a lot of times it's like you sign up for what you get. There are some people that I see a style. They have like a range of styles. Um, um, like, I feel like a lot of people that work on things like Lumberjanes and like they, they have their like Lumberjanes style and they have their mm -hmm. other style. Huh. And yeah. I love seeing people like that because I can talk to them and be like, oh, I like your style like here, like between this and this. And like for this book, that would work better than that book. And then there's some people that just have one style and that's perfectly fine. But it's so important, like having a clear website where you can find things easily <laughs> is... Mm -hmm. It, you, you don't understand how many times like editors don't really have that much time they're like, like we do spend a good right. amount like trying to find people but if i have to like dig through your website to find like your most recent sequential i'm going to step away <laughs> <laughs> so is it important that the pages are so if someone puts up three pages and it's page two page seven and page 14 that's not as helpful as putting up page two three and four so yeah. that you can see a flow, right? Exactly. Like we, we don't, we don't, I don't need to have 30 pages up there. I just need to have a like sequential like order of things, one through five, two to seven, like whatever, at least three pages. You think you're looking for something, I guess uh, you want to see that consistency, like of character art, mm -hmm. backgrounds, things like that, like all the things that you're looking for and some good quality comic pages. And exactly. what about like, just like, different genres like represented so what would you think about that i mean that's interesting because i never really i mean there's sometimes like it's obvious like i see someone who does like really there's some genres that you kind of need to know the person has a like feel for like mm -hmm. i think paranormal like horror is like a very specific one that like not everyone can do it and it's weird to right. say that because it's not like everyone can do fluff but honestly i feel like <laughs> those those are easier like the contemporary things are easier for people to do i think horror is a very specific one and humor is another one a humor yeah. is really difficult maybe i'd assume that you'd also see something you could glean something from someone's uh, illustration work i mean exactly. like oh, they they've done a quick illustration of something that might be in that other genre but on the whole their storytelling is strong in the comics exactly. pages I've seen. Mm -hmm. Full range. Great. 
what can a comic artist show you to prove that they can get the job done and done well like in the comics that you see like on their website um so i it's really it just gets down to drawing like it there are some people that sometimes uh we we're creative you know like we can find maybe an illustrator and see that like oh look if you like work on doing sequentials you can be like your art would work so nicely for kids or whatever age mm -hmm. um but the 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 foundation of skills that has to be there like I, lo I would love to have all the time in the world but i i can't as an editor walk someone through becoming a comics artist like i, I can't i can help them edit them and things like that but they have to know how to work a page and do dialogue and like work the sub through beginning to end and the only way to do that is to draw comics all the time as often as you can mm -hmm. and you can get creative too i've seen like uh or I've at least made the recommendation um you know you have a, an old mini comic that you probably you're not going to make or sell anymore put the whole thing up for free exactly like, yeah mm -hmm. i mean we were we were just talking um so dungeon critters mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah it was a uh, for natalie reason sarah getter mm -hmm. um just for anyone who's listening um <laughs> And I actually didn't know, like, until they put it, put it on their Twitter, that the cover is, like, the same as their mini-comic. It was a mini-comic. Yeah. That is how <laughs> this all became a book. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. Like, you don't have to draw 300 pages. You just have to have an idea. You know, it's like a seed. Um, and that was born from it. A whole book was born from that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I love collecting. I love collecting mini-comics. Just keep working at it. Because at the end of the day, you are going to, if you get signed up for a book, you're going to have to finish the comic. Yes. So, like, you're going to be <laughs> yes. really struggling if you don't have those chops in you already. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it, it's so important to be discovered. And I, it's so important, like, I know to get paid, duh. Like, that's, like, a huge <laughs> thing. But I would hate it if, like, someone takes a leap of faith on you and then you get stuck in the middle, like, oh, I don't actually think I can finish, like, a comic. It's, like, not oh, a boy. good place to be in. Mm -hmm. All right, Ed, do you want to... We're, we have we have some curveballs. We have some hard hitting questions. <laughs> Do you want to oh, get her with that last one? <laughs> oh, I don't know if you want me to. But here, can I give you my card through here? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm trying to well, find Ed my card. Well, Ed is also Ed is you know on this I don't know this journey I'm, as it yeah, were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we kind of want to know like, is there something like where you think there's like a red flag or where some artists kind of fail when it comes to just their portfolio online? it's always a plus to know that someone knows the market mm -hmm. and it's always a huge flag when they think they know the market and they don't like there's some people that they're drawing and they think this like certain things or their style that would work for kids like there's just some styles like if it, they look too grown it's not gonna work like the kids right. market is like particularly strange like right. stringent like they're so strict in really weird ways mm -hmm. um and like art unfortunately sometimes like looks too old to work in kids like i can tell when i see an art sound like oh that's gonna work really great in middle grade or i'm like oh that really works well in ya because they kind of have to look their age and mm -hmm. but it usually maybe it'll just work for adults for us like it won't work for a commercial middle grade or commercial ya it, it takes a, a bit more fitting in the puzzle and mm -hmm. nothing wrong with the style like i've seen some amazing styles i'm like what can this work with you know it just takes a lot more thinking or like what i say is the dc marvel style sure. like honestly <laughs> like it just doesn't work like that is not what we publish <laughs> um but like there's nothing there's such a wide range of portfolios and there's nothing that's like completely um a red flag aside from just making it difficult for yeah. me to find things i think people <laughs> more people should also like take some time and put things in there about me um mm -hmm. it is important there's some times that for a certain project i want a certain person and mm -hmm. it's hard to whether that be like i mean this is a whole bundle of i mean mostly like race and ethnicity mm, things about like sexuality and stuff like that that's a whole nother situation that mm -hmm. I don't want people to out themselves for no reason. Um, but there's sometimes I'm like, oh, I really, I was once like two years ago when I was developing a project that I wanted like a Latinx, a specific Latinx representation because mm -hmm. right. coming from my head, um, I found a Dominican writer and then I'm like, oh, I would love a Latinx like creator, but it's kind of hard to find. Like, I don't want to go out asking people, so what are you like? 
what's your ethnicity? <laughs> and like, I love that the younger generation on Twitter puts flags. Oh, I love yeah. that. Like puts little flags in their description, but not everyone does that. Or like, mm-hmm. but and sometimes I go to people's bio and like they can read ambiguous and it's hard to read people mm-hmm. based on what sure. they look like. So sure. I'm like, well, I don't know what to do if this person yeah. is that next or not. So I feel like some people should take a little more time with their bios, but there's nothing like, there's no, so far I've been in a website, there hasn't been any like huge red flags yeah. that I can think of. So like a bio and a means to contact you. Yes. <laughs> isn't hard <laughs> to find. So like yeah. we get there to that about page, it has some contact information. And if please, you have please, an please agent already, definitely put your mm-hmm. agent down because I don't want to contact you and bypass your agent if you have one. Sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Business cards aren't dead? All right. <laughs> no, it's true. I really liked hearing that, that that's where editors collect what they collect, if not comics, at comic conventions, if and when we return to them. <laughs> that's right. So I was wondering if, uh, you know, we thanks everyone for staying with us. We're going to take a couple of questions um, just to wrap up the evening. Jason. I just want to, but I just want to say like, yeah, it's, it's really the whole notion that editors are busy, are busy yeah. people. So it's in our best interest to make it as easy as possible for so them to easy. hire us. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important. And Lucy said something similar too. She said, make it as easy as possible for people to give you money to hire you and to follow your work. I know people noticed that and, and uh, chatted about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. First question. Hit us. Do you think it's better to have an online portfolio that appears cohesive or is it better to showcase the variety of work you do? Yeah, I think we heard a few different things from folks and I think it is all about, it's about curation. Um, I think it's important to be as selective as you can. I think you can do that many ways. You can. Uh, build your website or select your pieces and run it by friends, um, see what they think. Uh, There's that idea that less is more, sometimes more is more. You know, we heard those two things like from Elysian and Jesse, but um, I think it's more about focusing your work, however that is. If you have one great comic and you want to do comics for the future, you need to put that comic first, right? Like it needs right. to be, it's got to float to the top. Even if you, you don't have anything else, you know, you got to make sure that that's uh, spotlighted, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. Cool. Great. <laughs> I agree. Next question. Any tips for gearing your portfolio for the type of work you want to get right. versus the work you've done? So for example, um, Whitney mostly gets illustration commissions, but wants more comics work. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's why I've been doing, I've been jumping into comics more uh, on my own. I've been creating my own stuff so that that's the stuff that I'm able to start populating um, on my website and on social media and just start putting that in front of people. So if you're not getting the jobs of Mm -hmm. what you want to be doing, then do it on your own until you start getting those jobs. Yeah, a lot of comics that you do in the beginning are self-directed, and that's the thing that you have to do on your own, and then and then again showcase. Um, and I would also say that illustration is also a place. Like I think I I talked about it with uh, Kiara that um, illustration is also a place where you could explore like different styles for the comics that you want to get. Like say you just you haven't done that like sci-fi opus, but you'd love to one day, like you could, you could like kind of explore that through illustration. Um, And then, but just making sure that the backbone of your site and your portfolio, if you want to do comics is comics. Another question, how many pieces is too many pieces to showcase one single project, for example? Well, I think um, Lucy does such a great job of taking a whole bunch of images and putting them on her website. She doesn't just throw them on there though. Mm -hmm. She really considers as as she, as we went through her website, she really considers um, each block and to keep people's interest and the wording, she keeps it simple. And and then she gets to another image and then she keeps a, she puts a little bit of wording and then she gets to a bigger block of area of, of information or images. So it really depends on how you put it out there 
just keeping in mind that at some point it's going to be enough. And at some point you're going to lose people if at the very, very bottom is where you say, buy my book. Sure. Maybe, maybe, you know, if you're worried that that's going to happen, you put it at the top and the bottom. <laughs> yeah, I love, I, um, you know, we talked with Lucy for a long time and one of the other points that she made was the fact that um, you can't, you know, she's a big believer in putting her comics out for free you know, and letting people almost like kind of pay what they want or buy the book if they want and trusting your audience. So in some ways, if you feel like putting your entire mini comic you know, and it's the only thing that you've ever done, like it's 16 pages, you, you slaved over them, you want to start making some money off of them. Sure, we understand that, but maybe if you want to pursue like doing a graphic novel, you should put all 16 pages up, you know, just a, like just a theory if that's right for you. And you can still have that thing in the web store. You can still say, you can sure. also buy it. Uh, that's a consideration to be made, especially if you're starting, you know, from scratch or from one single project. So that would be my suggestion. Sure. Oh, great. And last question. Oh, cool. When okay. is it inappropriate to share your social media on your website? Um, well, I think we're all starting to get to a point where people recognize that we have uh like a social life that is technically online. Um, and people have navigated this different ways. You can have an account that's for your professional self and you can have, you know, your you know, hanging out with your friends self. Uh, and maybe that isn't the one that you link on your website, uh, right. potentially. Um, but, you know, I think people are, are understanding that there are many ways, it just depends on like the tone you're trying to hit, like on your portfolio, are you trying to get that audience of people to follow you the person, um, and your comics, or is it a, a more technically professional space where you would like them to just you know, follow your comics and you can use that in many different ways. I have a good friend who's, who has a really strong personality and, and she's a graphic designer. And rather than showing all graphic design, I see mostly her on her Instagram and for example, and um, that's what she's selling. She's selling like her personality and it draws people in because she's, she's wonderful at both at, mm -hmm. at uh, the, the person she is and also at uh, graphic design. So you kind of have to figure out if that if that's working for you or if you want to make that work for you. Right. But I agree I with Shelly. Otherwise, sure. yeah. otherwise, if you're going to point people from your website to your social media and you want to get jobs or you want to get fans or cultivate fans, then think about what they actually want, what they're looking for when they click on that social media link. Yeah. Yeah. I advocate for, you know, being your authentic self, like however that is, just as long as you know, like what you're putting out there. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Well, thanks again, everyone for doing, yeah. you know, for closing out the show with us. <laughs> yeah. This the, is, oh, this it's the end been of mice. a real treat. Yeah. To do mice in this form, even though it was a little different and we miss seeing all of your faces, but thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks Jake and Jason, you can take this out. Okay, now it's time to announce the two winners of the Graphic Artist Guild Handbook, Pricing and Ethical Guidelines, Kay Rose and Patrick Lugo. Congratulations, and someone from MICE will be in touch with you soon via email. Thank you for coming. This session is part of the Month of MICE, a month of free comics programs, including panel discussions and workshops. This is our last session. If you've been with us all month, Thank you so much for participating in this experiment. It's been an incredible experience, but if you've missed any of it, all of our programming, including panels like Making a Career in Comics and Fully Funded, a Kickstarter Q&A, are still available for viewing. For a full list of sessions, visit miceexpo.org, that's M-I-C-E-X-P-O.org, or click that button again and check out our fundraising raffle where you can win a free lifetime master level subscription to Artwork Archive, plus other cool prizes. The drawing is this week, so get your tickets now. And thank you again, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>